those who have believed in Christ gather all around the world on a Sunday, on Sundays, not this Sunday, to celebrate the Lord's resurrection from the dead. So whether you're in a dark and difficult season waiting for the Lord through the storm and through the night, as we just sang, or whether you're in a brighter season, now we have resurrection hope because Christ has risen from the grave. Amen? Amen. Amen. My name is PJ. I'm one of the pastors here, and it's a joy to bring God's word to you this morning. And so, because man must not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God, please take your Bible and open it to James chapter 5. James chapter 5, verses 13 through 18. James 5, 13 through 18. As you're turning there, it's on page 1073 and 1074 if you're using a Bible in the chair in front of you, the hardcover, black hardcover Bible. You can turn to page 1073 and 1074. As you turn to James 5, let me introduce the sermon this way and the text by saying we, we've been learning in the book of James that God wants us to grow in wisdom so that we would be mature and complete lacking in nothing. That's what it says in James 1.4, so that we would be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. And then he says in verse 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask of God, and God would give it to him if he asks in faith, so that we would endure and be blessed in Christ. And so the call of the book is a call to wisdom. We'll read the definition of, a wisdom, of, the, of wisdom after we um, begin our sermon. But let's, let's hear God's word now as we think about wisdom applied to prayer in James 5, verses 13 to 18. Hear God's word. Is anyone among you suffering? He should pray. Is anyone cheerful? He should sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? He should call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick person, and the Lord will raise him up. If he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is very powerful in its effect. Elijah was a human being as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain on the land. Then he prayed again, and the sky gave rain, and the land produced its fruit. This is the word of the Lord. May the word of Christ dwell richly among us. Father, we ask now that you would incline our hearts to your word, to your testimonies, and not to material gain. Open our eyes to see wonderful things in your word, to see the glories of Christ, to see your glory and to be changed from one degree of glory to the next. Convict us of sin. Show us our sin of prayerlessness, our doubt, our lack of faith. Cleanse us and restore us in you. Unite our hearts to fear your name. Guard us from having a divided heart, a double mind, unstable in our ways. May your word unify our hearts. Satisfy us this morning with your steadfast love so that we would rejoice and be glad in you today. Lord Jesus, you've taught us that apart from you, we can do nothing. We can't meditate and I can't preach and we can't sit under your word with any fruitfulness if you don't come and help us. So abide in us and help us to abide in you now by your spirit's power and make us a prayerful people. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, like I've been saying, like I said before we read the scripture text, James wants us to grow in wisdom. He wants us to grow in wisdom. And so if we lack wisdom, we should ask God. He gives wisdom. And wisdom is the theme of the book of James. If you look at James 3, verses 13 to 18, we have a, a contrast of wisdom. James is clarifying divine and heavenly wisdom by contrasting it with demonic and earthly wisdom. So... Um, if you have verse 14 of James 3, if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your heart, don't boast and deny the truth. That's an earthly, unspiritual, and demonic wisdom. But look at verse 17. The wisdom that comes from above, the wisdom that we seek to grow in, is first pure, then peace-loving, gentle, compliant, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without pretense. 
And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who cultivate peace. James is calling us to grow in wisdom, and he wants us to grow in Christ by growing in divine wisdom. And so there are different contrasts throughout the whole book. And here in our passage this morning, in James 5, 13 through 18, we have three challenges to wisdom. What about when you're suffering? Can I just pursue Christ and wisdom after I'm done suffering? Because I'm really hurting right now, but once I get over this, then I will pursue Christ and his wisdom. Or what if you're cheerful? He talks about cheerfulness in verse 13, you're on, a, you're on a high, life is going well, things are going really, really well. Let me come down from my, my high and then, and then I'll pursue God again. But right now I'm doing pretty good, I'm really happy right now. Or the challenge of sickness. When we're knocked out by sickness and we're so sick that we barely have any spiritual strength to call on the Lord. Maybe I could grow in wisdom after I'm over my sickness. After I'm no longer sick, then I can grow in wisdom. Then I can enjoy Christ. Then I can go deeper in the wisdom from heaven that God has for me. Those are three challenges to wisdom. And we, we get tempted to wait until the season is over, and then we'll connect with the Lord. Have you ever done that? Or am I the only one who, who thinks, well, once I get through this difficult or busy season of my life, then I will go deeper in God's wisdom. Then I'll connect with Jesus Christ. And James wants us to grow in wisdom now. Right now, in suffering, in cheerfulness, in sickness, we can grow in wisdom. We can deepen our walk with the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the wisdom of God. And so here's the main goal. Wisely pray and seek prayers of the righteous. Wisely pray and seek the prayers of the righteous so that you grow in divine wisdom. Pray and seek the prayers of the righteous so that you grow in divine wisdom. And those are the three challenges in suffering and cheerfulness and in sickness. So let's look at those one at a time. Look at verse 13. We get the first two in verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? What should he do? He should what? He should pray. We, we might think, or the world might think, if you're suffering, go shopping. Right? Get on Amazon.com, your app on your phone, and start browsing and get your mind off. Distract yourself by shopping and feeling good because you know, those brown boxes bring a little bit of happiness, don't they? A little bit of distraction, can't wait to open it. Maybe you distract yourself with entertainment. Or if you're suffering, find a solution to the suffering. Stop the bleeding, find a way to stop the suffering. Or if you're suffering, complain. Find someone to complain to so that they can resonate with that deep human connection of complaining together. Or even worse, sometimes we might take out our suffering on other people, lash out on others, put the pressure on us, on other people who have nothing to do with the problem because we are suffering. God tells us that our lives are lived in another story. God is in control and God is good and God is present. Deb talked about God's imminence. We praise God for his imminence, that he is with us in every situation, that God has plans and purposes for our suffering, and we will suffer. And so, so therefore, we should, if anyone's suffering, he should what? He should pray. But isn't prayer a waste of time? Does it solve anything? Does it do anything? I'm suffering. Find a way to solve the trial. Figure it out. Find a way forward. And James says, no, no, Pray. He's not saying only pray, but he's saying you certainly should pray. We should pray. We are wise to pray when we are suffering so that our hearts are not pushed away from God in the suffering, so that we're not pushed away in the pain, so we're, that we're not isolated in the suffering, isolated from God, drawn away from God. But when we pray, we're drawn to God because suffering doesn't leave you in the same place spiritually. You are not immovable. You are easily and always moving. And suffering moves us. It moves you towards God or moves you away from God. And so pray. Prayer draws you to God and draws you away from the devil. That's what James said in James 4. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. So pray. 
And in prayer, you don't have to pray a holy spiritual prayer of praise necessarily. You could lament to God. That's still prayer. Turn to God and complain to God. When you read the Psalms, dozens and dozens of Psalms are prayers to God complaining about the pain, complaining about the suffering, and asking God for help, and trusting God to come through even when they can't see how he will come through. Lamenting to God in prayer is a way, it's a godly way to protest against the suffering and the powers that be. Lamenting is a godly way of processing your emotions, even your anger, even righteous anger, to keep it from becoming sinfully bitter and giving the devil an opportunity. Lamenting to God, and when you pray in suffering, it gives voice to your confusion, because suffering is disorienting. Suffering confuses us. It makes the clear unclear. It cloudies our vision. And so we pray to God and voice our confusion. Prayer helps us to do what James 1, 2 tells us. Brothers and sisters, consider it all joy when you fall into various trials. All joy? That's hard, right? How do I consider my trials all joy? Pure joy, great joy, as the CSB says. How do you do that? I don't always know, but prayer is a good, it's a good start. If you're suffering, if you're in trial, pray. Come to God. Prayer is a means of God giving you his wisdom and perspective in the moment of trial because you lack wisdom in trials. So pray and God gives you wisdom in trials. That's what Paul did when he was suffering, right? Paul prayed when he was in suffering. In 2 Corinthians 12, verses 7 through 10, Paul writes, so that I would not exalt myself, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of, of Satan, to torment me. Paul was being tormented by this thorn in the flesh. We don't have time to, to unpack what that, what that thorn is, but the point is that he was suffering. He was being tormented. He, it was to torment me so that I would not exalt myself. And then he says, concerning this, I pleaded with the Lord. That's another way of saying I prayed, Right? I pleaded with the Lord three times that this thorn would leave me. But he said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. Therefore, Paul says, I will most gladly boast all the more about my weaknesses, about my torments, about my suffering, so that Christ's power may reside in me. So I take pleasure in weaknesses or sicknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and in difficulties for the sake of Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. He prayed. Didn't find his strength in the suffering going away. Didn't find his strength in his own body and in his own spiritual power. But Christ's power residing in him, accessed through three times praying, right? Praying and praying and praying. And hearing God say, no, no, no and yet strength. And so we sing songs like we're gonna close in this morning, singing, have we trials and temptations, cumbered with a load of care. We should never, or we need not be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Take it to the Lord in prayer when you're suffering. Now, if you're not a Christian, you might say, PJ, this is the reason I would never become a Christian. You say that God is good and that God is loving and that God is wise and that God cares and that God is powerful. If God is powerful and loving, why is there suffering in the world? Either he's loving and he's, he's wise, but he doesn't have the power to change it, so we're suffering, or he's powerful and can't change it, but he, he's, he's, he's not good. He's not loving. He doesn't care. He can't be good and powerful if there's suffering in the world. So you could keep your Christianity to yourself. Thank you very much. But the God of the Bible doesn't make any sense. He cannot be the true God because there's all kinds of horrific, and there is horrific suffering in our world today, right now, this moment. If, if that's what you're thinking, let me give a, a brief response here. This could be a whole sermon or series of sermons and lectures on it, but let me give you a brief response. Number one, I have to confess that, that the Bible gives us, at best, a half answer. In other words, God doesn't reveal all things to us. He has kept something secret to us, just like he did to a man named Job who was going through a lot of suffering. 
God at best gives us in the Bible a half answer. But I will say this, if you're not a Christian, the Bible's half answer is better than every other answer in the world, in every philosophy, in every religion. There is no better answer. The problem of suffering in this world and what it means is a problem for everybody, not just Christians. That's a hard question for everyone to think about, okay? So even though I'm giving you somewhat of a half answer, I just want to say, what is your answer to this problem? What does suffering mean to you? So that's number one. And secondly, though, if you can dismiss God because he's either too powerful or uh, too powerful and, and, and yet not good, or he's, he's so good, but he's not powerful. If he's so good or if he's so powerful, if God is big enough to be powerful so that you could blame him for, for the problems in the world, then he's big enough to have a reason that you can't understand for why the problems are there. You can't have it both ways. You can't get mad at God for being big and then for you not understanding his reasons why we don't understand everything. You can't have it both ways. Either, and if he is, and if he always oh, says, okay, so PJ, so he is a small God who isn't powerful. Well, that's not the God of the Bible. So I reject that God with you. So if that's your God who's so small that he's not powerful enough and you reject that God, I am right there with you. We're the right there with you. We reject that God, which is not really a God. And thirdly, and maybe most importantly, maybe for some of you, at least on the emotional side of it, God is not indifferent to our suffering. God cares about your pain. And we know this because he doesn't just teach us from the Bible. He actually came and became a man and entered into this world and entered into the brokenness and entered in the suffering and suffered more than anyone on earth has ever suffered. And he's the only truly innocent one who doesn't deserve to suffer. And yet he suffered because he cares about your suffering. So that's, the, that's, uh, that's one sketch of, of the Bible's answer. I would just encourage you, if you're not a Christian, this is the reason you're not a Christian, to think about these things and trust in the God who became a man and lived for you and suffered for you and died for you and rose for you so that you might know this God and know his hope and, and goodness and wisdom in suffering so that you could do what we're all doing here, which is if anyone is suffering, he should pray. If you're not a Christian, there's an invitation for you to pray too if you'd come to Jesus Christ. The good news is that God is not deaf. God hears our prayers. He's attentive. I'm not deaf, but sometimes I'm not attentive. When my kids are pulling on me or asking me something and my mind is spaced out somewhere else, not attentive. God is attentive to our prayers. He's not spaced out. He hears you. He's attentive and attending to your prayers. And he draws near to you in your suffering. So wisely pray and seek the prayers of the righteous so that you grow in divine wisdom. First, pray if you're suffering. Secondly, sing if you're cheerful. Pray if you're suffering. Secondly, sing if you're cheerful. Look at verse 13 again. Is anyone cheerful? He should what? Sing praises. Praise God that even in this broken world, it's not all gloom. There are moments of cheerfulness. There are moments of happiness. There are moments of joy. We will be cheerful at times. And when we're cheerful, sometimes we're so cheerful that we can forget about God and just delight in the cheerfulness for cheerfulness sake. And James gives us a way to be wise and not waste. Don't waste your suffering, but don't waste your cheerfulness either. Your cheerful moments, your cheerful seasons are seasons to go deeper in divine wisdom, to draw nearer to God. We would be wise to sing when we're cheerful, because music pushes the truth deeper into your heart. You can speak truth to your mind, but music and the melody pushes the truths deeper into your heart, and it's easier to memorize. Let's just be honest. It's easier to memorize songs when there's a melody. You should sing, cheer, sing praises to God when you're cheerful because it deepens the divine wisdom in you. The wisdom goes deeper in you, and it uproots the demonic wisdom that's seeking to subvert you, the earthly wisdom the unspiritual wisdom. It gets subverted and uprooted as you sing praises to God in your cheerfulness because your cheerfulness can easily grow your worldliness. James 4.4, 4, right? If anyone loves the world, the love... Well, that's cheap. That's First John 2, sorry. Uh, James 4.4. 4, um, let me read it to you because I can't quote it right now. Um, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? When we pray, sometimes we pray amiss, we ask with wrong motives because there's worldliness there. Well, when you're cheerful, sing praises to God. That uproots 
And that pushes out the worldliness in the cheerfulness. And it sanctifies and transforms the cheerfulness. It centers your cheer back on your greatest joy, your greatest treasure, your greatest cheer, Christ Jesus himself. So when you sing praises, not only that, it it draws your attention to God. It gives the credit to God for your cheerfulness. And it focuses you on God. So you could sing sing songs like, All Glory Be to Christ, when you're experiencing the glory in this world of something that cheers you up. Singing roots your joy and cheer in the Lord, and it maximizes the staying power and benefit of those fleeting pleasures. Because pleasures are fleeting, right? I mean, praise God for the cheerfulness. It's great. But if we want to maximize the benefit, because it, it, fl- it will fade away, we want to maximize the benefit of that season of cheerfulness, then sing praises to God. That's what the Israelites did. When they, I mean, you, you could imagine, maybe one of, one of the, the most, I mean, you know, there's, Top 10 scenes you'd go back to in the, Bible, in the Bible story, right? This has to be in everyone's top 10, I would hope, um, is the crossing of the Red Sea, right? There they are at the coast. The Egyptian army is chasing the Israelites, one million uh, men and women and children, over a million, and they're there, former slaves just freed, and now they're trying to get to the promised land. They're stuck, and there's the army coming, and they're stuck, and all there is is a sea in front of them. And God tells Moses to raise his arms, and Moses raises his arms, and then God blows onto the sea and divides the ocean so that there's walls of water on both sides, and in the middle, it's dry ground, not wet soil, right? After you water the grass or if you water the dirt, no, not wet soil, dry ground. The bottom of the ocean, dry ground. And they walk through on dry ground. The Egyptian army chases them in, and then God closes the water on the Egyptian army, and they all die. And God's people are on the other side, and they are, to put it mildly, cheerful. And what do they do? They sing praises. Listen to some of the lyrics of their song from Exodus 15. They sang, I will sing to the Lord, to Yahweh, for he is highly exalted. He has thrown the horse and its rider into the sea. Yahweh is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My father's God, and I will exalt him. Yahweh is a warrior. Yahweh is his name. He threw Pharaoh's chariots and his army into the sea. The elite of his officers were drowned in the Red Sea. Sounds like he's freestyling here, right? There's no, no rhymes here. Just, just, just talking, singing, right? Like a musical. Just start singing to the Lord. Make up your own song when you're cheerful. Verse 17 and 18 of Exodus 15. You, they keep, the song continues or it ends this way. You will bring them, speaking of Israel, you will bring them in and plant them on the mountain of your possession. Yahweh, you have prepared the place for your dwelling. Yahweh, your hands have established the sanctuary. Yahweh will reign forever and ever. What a song. If anyone's cheerful, sing praises. Some maybe practical examples. You could take bulletins like this home. We could have a projector here, but we we have bulletins for a few reasons. One of them is that you could take them home. You could obey this command, sing praises. I don't know what to sing. Take your bulletins home. Keep it in your Bible. Pull it out and sing praises to God. Memorize songs. Sing during your devotional time. I'm tempted to ask you to raise your hand. How many of you sing during your devotional time? I'd encourage you to sing praises to God. And have go-to songs. Do you have any go-to songs that you go to when you're cheerful? I think if you're going to apply this spontaneously, you're not going to always have a bulletin with you, right? If you have a good moment, how, what, what songs might you sing? Anyone here? I'm just curious. Any songs come to your mind that you might sing in a situation like that? Jevin? God is so good to me. Yeah. Is that the one that God is so good? God is so good? Okay. That's what I have to. God is good. Yeah. God is so good. Any other songs you guys might sing? The doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Autumn. I love you, Lord. Great. Yeah. So uh, thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. You've done so much for me. Memorize some of these songs. Have them ready. If you're discipling your kids, sing with your kids. Let's sing to the Lord. Sing when you eat or after you're done eating or before you're eating. Maybe I'm on my little Hobbit kick. I've been reading The Hobbit and listening to The Hobbit, and I'm just so, so impressed by when they sang the song after 
after they ate and how powerful it affects Bilbo Baggins. It makes him want to go on the adventure and fight dragons, that their story becomes his story, and he's ready to go wherever they're calling to go on an adventure. The power of music and songs that captivates us and brings us to God. If you're cheerful, sing praises. And just so you know, BBC, we sing a lot of songs here on Sunday. It's not just to fill time. It's not because we're bored and we just want a long service for long service sake. Even our pre-singing, even our pre-singing is not a time filler. It's a heart filler. It's a mind filler. It's trying to teach you songs so that you can obey this passage. So you could sing songs of praise when you're cheerful. So you could sing songs of prayer when you're suffering. Dear refuge of my weary soul, I will wait for you. I will wait for you. On your word, I will rely. Songs help us pray, and songs help us praise. If you're not a Christian, I know you, if you're not a Christian, most, most people in this world loves, love music. They love singing, they love songs. And I want to invite you, you can have music that feeds and sustains and lifts your soul like no song can that ignores God. So wisely pray and seek the prayers of the righteous so that you grow in divine wisdom. You do that by praying when you're suffering, singing when you're cheerful, and lastly, calling for pastoral prayer if you're sick, the prayer of the elders. Elders are pastors, are overseers in the Bible. But we use the word pastor here, so I'll just say it that way, but that's what it means by elders. Call for pastoral prayer if you're sick, okay? So there's a third opportunity. Call for pastoral prayer if you're sick. Look at verse 14. Is anyone among you sick? He should call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him. So in the first one, when you're suffering, you pray. When you're cheerful, you pray a, prayer, a song of praise. But when you're suffering or when you're sick, call for the elders, and they are to pray over him, anointing with oil in the name of the Lord. Well, we will get sick. And here it's calling for the elders, and they'll pray over him so that maybe, maybe most likely this person is bedridden or they, they, can't, they can't get to the church gathering, they can't get to the elders, so they're calling for the elders to get to them. So it's not just, oh, I have a cold, I got a runny nose, let's call for the elders, you know, um, to anoint my head with oil, you know, because I got allergies, you know, um, to take Claritin, <laughs> right? This is talking about when, you're, when you're, you're on your bed and you're sick, you call for the elders of the church and the elders come and they anoint this person with oil. So if you want to grow in divine wisdom, you would be wise to call for the elders to pray over you when you're sick. Now, I would confess, I probably should and just will confess as a pastor that I, I can and should and must improve in praying for you and even uh, inviting myself over and insisting to come and pray with you when you are sick and bedridden along with the other pastors. But I want you to notice in this passage, who is the command to? Is it to the elders? It's not to the elders. What's the command to? To the members, to the, to the Christians, to the sick, right? The command is not to the elders to go there. The command is to the, those who are under the elders to what? What's, their, what's the command? What are they supposed to do? Call for the elders. I could modify this or update it by saying, text the elders. <laughs> Email the elders, right? Communicate somehow with the elders that you're sick and that you need prayer. And the elders will come and anoint you with oil and pray over you, it says in verse 14, in the name of the Lord. I have a question here. If, 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 uh, do you have elders? If, if you're not a member of this church, I want to, I mean, if you're going to apply this text, do you, do you have elders? And the answer is yes, if you're a member of some gospel preaching church that has pastors, elders, overseers, then you have elders. So the way you apply this text is go to the pastors of your local church, your home church, and ask them to pray for you. Now, if you're a Christian and you're not part of a church, I mean, you can still ask us. We'll, we'll, we'll happily pray for you. But, but you can't really obey a lot of the New Testament unless, you have, unless you're part of a church and you have your own elders who are responsible to give an account for your soul, it says in Hebrews 13, 17. So I just want to call on you, if you're a Christian and you're not a member of a church, you need to join a church so that you can have elders, so that you can obey this passage, okay? 
And then if you do have elders, I want to tell everyone else who has elders, communicate with your elders when you're sick and weak and in need of prayer. And one of the things I was convicted by or encouraged by from this passage is that when I'm sick and when I get to a very serious sickness, when I'm feeling really weak, that I'll still call on the other elders. Even though I'm an elder myself, that doesn't mean I just pray for myself. I can still call on and still will call on the other elders to come, the other pastors and overseers of our church to come and pray over me because that's what the text says. Now, this is not against calling for doctors. This is not an anti-medicine text, anti-medical care, that everything is spiritual and only spiritual, and there's no physical or medical explanations or solutions to your sickness. So yes, call for doctors if you need them. But beyond and beside calling for doctors, along with calling for doctors, call for the elders. Because you don't just need physical strength, you need spiritual strength. You don't just need physical healing. You need spiritual strength and a focus and health and vision and communion with God. And so the elders will come. They'll pray for you, and that will draw you closer to the elders, and it will help draw you to God as well. Because sometimes we're so sick and we're so weak that we could barely pray ourselves. Our minds are not sharp. Our concentration is shot. Our desire is zero, and so we just call for others to pray for us when we can't even pray for ourselves. We call for the elders to pray for us. And they anoint with oil. Now, this is neither medicinal. Some people think it's medicinal or sacramental. The Roman Catholics would use this. Roman papist church would use it as um, one of the seven sacraments, the last rites. But this is used, the oil is used to consecrate and set apart the person for concentrated prayer. And it's a reminder that this person belongs to God. There's no magic in the oil, but there's no magic in kneeling when you pray. But it's okay to pray. It's okay to not kneel when you pray. It's okay to, we, we saying, so we raise up holy hands. I'm tempted to ask how many here raised up their holy hands. You, you could praise God in raising up holy hands. Psalm 63 certainly tells us to raise up holy hands while we pray, while we praise God. So it's something that you can do. You don't have to do that in every song. You might want to do it when you're singing, raise up holy hands, but that's beside the point. The, po- the, the point is, there's no magic in raising up holy hands. There's no magic in kneeling. There, the, even when we pray in Jesus' name, that incantation in Jesus' name, those are words to say. There's power in it, because not because it's magic words, but if it makes you think about Jesus and his name, and that you're in him, and that your prayer is in him, and for him, and from him, that, that, that helps in your prayer. So oil, as well, is not magic, but... It helps you focus on God. It helps me when I've done this with different members. Helps me focus on the seriousness of the the task here to pray, the responsibility I have as a pastor. I I trust it helps the person I'm praying over to realize that God is here in this moment. We know God is there, but it's just another tangible way of knowing that God is here in this moment listening to this prayer. So they'll pray over you and it says, and, and I'll just say, if God heals, who gets the credit? God does. That's, is that a good thing or a bad thing? That you give God credit when you get healed? That's a good thing, right? If you, if you just merely take the medicine, wait it out, um, if you've done that in the past, how many have done that in the past without, without calling for the elders? You just had a sickness, you're kind of bedridden, you just kind of waited out and, and found a way and got better. How many, raise your hand if that's happened to you before. Okay, almost all of us. And what I want to say is those are wasted opportunities. Wasted opportunities to grow in, in wisdom. Wasted opportunities to grow closer to the Lord. Wasted opportunities to grow closer to your pastors. Wasted opportunities to, to worship. But, but God's going to heal me anyways, right? Yeah, is all of life about just being physically healthy? Is that divine wisdom? Does that sound like heavenly or does that sound earthly? That's an earthly wisdom, right? Earthly, unspiritual, demonic wisdom. As opposed to divine, heavenly, and, um, divine, heavenly, and spiritual wisdom. And so don't waste these opportunities. They'll pray for you. And then it says here, let's read on in the verse. In verse 15, the prayer of faith will save the sick person and the person and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. So why should you call for the elders? Because it says in verse 15, the prayer of faith will what? When they pray, it'll save the sick person. It'll save them. And if they've sinned, they'll be what? Forgiven. Forgiven. And in verse 16, it says, um, confess your sins to one another, pray for one another, so that you may be what? 
healed. So why call for the elders? Because you will be saved or healed from your sickness and give glory to God and grow in divine wisdom and drawing near to God. Now, here's the question, and this is the difficulty here. Is this a statement that is promising that every sickness and weakness you'll have, and by the way, it could be saying, it could also be translated, is anyone among you weak? Is anyone among you sick or weak? So could it refer to spiritual weakness or physical weakness? Is this a promise that for every sickness or weakness, God will always heal and save? Let me, let me, so that, that's the hard part here. What does this mean? Is this a superpower, right? Is it, oh, pastors have superpowers or is it the gift of healings? Because there's, the, there's a list of gifts and in in spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians and there's the gift of healings or gifts of healings. Is it that? There's the gift of faith. Spiritual gift of faith is the prayer of faith referring to the spiritual gift of faith. Is this a health, wealth, and prosperity thing that if you just whip up enough faith in prayer, then you will for sure certainly always be healed? Now, how many you think it refers to when you do this right, you'll always, always, always be healed? Okay. Let me give you uh, three kind of theological things to think about to frame this, this, this discussion, this passage. One, not everyone who is prayed for, even by righteous people and confesses sins, is healed every single time. That's just true. People eventually will die, even if you apply this passage correctly. In Titus chapter 3, verse 20, uh, Paul says that he leaves, I can't remember the brother's name now, he leaves one of the brothers in Christ sick in Miletus. Don't you have faith, Paul? Why don't you obey this passage? So, sick. So he's still, you know, so, so, so this is not referring to, to that when, when Paul was in, in Philippians, in Philippi, or the saints from Philippi send Epaphroditus to Paul, and Epaphroditus almost dies from sickness. And Paul said it was mourning and grieving. And just, just heal him real quick, put the oil on and, and get it done. So, so no, it's not like, this is not a guarantee, I would say, that everyone who's prayed for will always be healed every single time. Secondly, sickness, certainly, I think in this passage, it has to refer to physical sickness. So I think if you absolutely spiritualize this to say it's only referring to spiritual weakness, I, I think that is not, that in, my, in my view, that's not acceptable. Now, can it refer to spiritual weakness as well? Perhaps. I, I tend to think it certainly included in here because we are body and soul, Right? Fancy word is psychosomatic. We are psychosomatic beings, body and soul together as one being. So what you feel physically affects you spiritually and, and vice versa. The word sick can mean weak and could, could include spiritual weakness. That's the third thing, is that it could include spiritual weakness. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 10 um, that he rejoices even in his weaknesses with the thorn in the flesh. So what does it mean that he will, look, look at verse 16 again, or verse 15. What does it mean when it says the prayer of faith will save the sick person. Does it mean spiritually save and in the end he'll have his salvation? Well, probably could include that perhaps. But I think once you take out the fact that this is not guaranteeing a 100% healing for every single situation, once you realize that this is not guaranteeing that, then this passage can just be very easily applied. Okay? This is similar to something like Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go and he will not what? Depart from it? Is that a guarantee that every single child who's trained up in Christ and in the way will never, ever depart? No, that's not true. Or even to go to New Testament, because James is relying a lot on the teachings of Jesus, Matthew 7, verses 7 through 11, where Jesus says, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be open to you. I got this out of order. And the first one is ask and you will receive. Ask and you'll receive. And then Matthew 7, verse 11, listen to verse 11. Because this, is, this to me, I would just take... James 5, in, the similar, in a similar spirit of Matthew 7, verse 11. Matthew 7, 11 says, If you then who are evil know how to give good gi gifts to your children, how much will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask him? God will give good. Ask and you'll receive. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be open to you. God is good and he will give good gifts to his children. And how, how, often is good, how often is God good? Always, all the time, right? So when you pray and you ask and you seek and you knock, how often will God be good to you in response? All the time, always, right? Even if you don't get what you want when you want it. 
even if the door you're knocking on isn't open when you want it to open. God will be good. And so as you call for these prayers and you get this pastoral prayer of faith, it strengthens your soul in God. And when it says the, the prayer of faith will save them, I don't want to divorce too quickly saving spiritually from saving physically. It, it could be just physical, referred to here. I think it is that primarily. But when you read through the gospel accounts, Jesus talks about saving, about physical, physical saving with a spiritual implication. So for example, I'll read you two passages from Mark. Listen to Mark 5.34. You could turn there if you're fast enough. Mark 5.34 says this. This is the woman who is bleeding for 12 years. And uh, she touches Jesus' robe and she gets healed. And Jesus says to her in Mark 5.34, daughter, he said to her, your faith has saved you. Go in peace and be healed from your affliction. And then the same thing in Mark 10.52, just to give you another example. Mark 10.52 Jesus says to um, the blind man who he gives sight to, he says, I want to see. And Jesus said to him, go, your faith has saved you. Immediately, he, began to, he could see and began to follow Jesus on the road. Faith saved his sight. Faith saved the woman from her bleeding. Faith, faith saved her. Saved is that spiritual saving or physical saving? I don't, Jesus doesn't always draw that sharp of a distinction between the two. And I don't, I, I'm, I'm inclined to not draw that sharp of a distinction here. It will do spiritual good as well. As long as you even think about save, not just as justification only, but the whole process of salvation, from regeneration to justification and transformation, and in the end, glorification. Prayer of faith will save. And when it says the prayer of faith, what is that? Is that the gift of faith? I don't think the prayer of faith there is the gift of faith. Look at James, if you're in James chapter one. We have, we have the prayer of faith in James one, verses five through eight. If anyone of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God or pray, right? That's what prayer is, ask God. Who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly and it will be given to him, it will be. But let him ask in what? Let him ask in faith without doubting. Let him pray in faith without doubting. For the doubters like the surging sea driven and tossed by the wind, that person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded, being double-minded and unstable in all his ways. So here the prayer of faith is a prayer that God will give generously. He'll give the divine wisdom and the saving and the healing that is needed for this person in their sickness and their weakness. And so if we continue on in James 5, James 5, 16 again, or 15, the prayer of faith will save the sick person and the Lord will raise him up. That's, I think that's primarily raise him up out of the bed in the physical aspect of the sickness, maybe an allusion to, to certainly being raised up on the last day, that final salvation, that final resurrection. And then in verse 15, and if he has committed sins, if the elders have prayed for him, he will be forgiven. So this is why you should... Call for the elders, because you will be forgiven if you have any sins. Now, this is the key to, to, um, to, 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 to the gospel for us as sinners. This is, this is the good news of the gospel, that sinners like us can be forgiven of our sins. If you're not a Christian here, and you forget everything else I say, remember this main message of Christianity. You are a sinner who can be forgiven of your sins through Jesus Christ. That is the good news of the gospel. The bad news is that we're all sinners. And because God is holy and made you, you cannot escape him. Because he knows all things, he knows all of your sins. Because he's the judge at the end of the day, you will not escape the judgment. You and I are damned and condemned to hell forever for our sins. That's our judgment. And yet, the good news is that God sent his son Jesus to live the life we should have lived in righteousness his son Jesus died on the cross for our sins and he rose from the dead so that if you repent from your sins and trust in Jesus Christ, you will be forgiven. You will be saved. He'll give you his Holy Spirit to live in you and he'll empower you to follow him the rest of your life here. You die, go to heaven, Christ comes again, we rise with him and live with him forever on a new earth. That offer is for you. 
Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So call on the Lord if you're not a Christian. Even children, call on the Lord to save you from your sins. That's the good news. But Christians need forgiveness too, right? Even as a Christian. Yeah, you're justified, you're declared righteous, forgiven of your sins, past, present, and future. But still, in the day-to-day life, we still sin and we still need forgiveness of our sins practically and communally with the Lord. And so if you're sick, call for the elders. They pray for you, they anoint you with oil, you'll be healed. And if you have sins, your sins will be forgiven. Why does he bring sins into this issue? Because there's a spiritual dimension to it. But uh, But really, sometimes our sickness is because of sin. Did you know that? Sometimes your sickness, and I said sometimes, but it's true. Sometimes your sickness is because of sin. I always stop short of reading 1 Corinthians 11.30 when I do the Lord's Supper. I stop at 1 Corinthians 11.29, so I've done you a disservice over the years in equipping you for this point. So let me read to you 1 Corinthians 11.30 right now. If you're taking the Lord's Supper without recognizing the body, drinking judgment on yourself. Paul says... This is why many are sick and ill among you, and many have fallen asleep. Some of you are sick and ill because you're not discerning or recognizing the body of Christ. You're not honoring Christ and his church, if I'm just using the 1 Corinthians 11 context. But the point here is sin can cause sickness. Sin has caused death for Ananias and Sapphira when they were lying to the Holy Spirit. And and, and this point is maybe no clearer then, then in Psalm 32, you could turn there if you want. Psalm 32, 1 through 7. Psalm 32, 1 through 7. Or you could just listen. This is David. Remember, David was hiding his sin of adultery and murder for almost a year, for several months. And David said... In Psalm 32, 1, how joyful is the one whose transgression is forgiven and whose sin is covered. How joyful is the person whom the Lord does not charge with iniquity, in whose spirit there is no deceit. Why? Why why are they joyful? Why are you joyful when you're forgiven, David? When I kept silent, David says in verse 3, when I hid my sin, I kept silent, what happened? My bones became brittle from my what? Groaning all day long. Do you ever feel a lack of peace and groaning because you're hiding sin? and you're faking it, you're keeping silent, and you're coming Sunday after Sunday with the face of hypocrisy, putting on a mask, but inside you're groaning all day long. Verse four, for day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was drained as in the summer's heat. Physical consequences, draining, exhaustion, heavy hand of God, groaning all day. Why? Because he hid his sin. Then verse five, then I acknowledged my sin to you and I did not what? Conceal my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to Yahweh and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is faithful do what? Pray to you immediately. When great floodwaters come, they will not reach him. You are my hiding place. You protect me from trouble. You surround me with joyful shouts of deliverance. That's why we pray. If you sin, confess your sins. When the elders come, when I do this, and I come, I ask them, Is there, are there any sins you need to confess to the Lord? Are you hiding anything? Is there sin there that you're hiding that you need to confess? Because sometimes our sickness is caused by sin. Now I said sometimes, because sometimes it's not. So if you call for me and the elders to come, I'm not assuming you're sinning. I'm not saying, what did you do this time? (laughs) Come out with it, right? That's not going to be the spirit with which I come. Because Job was suffering, right? You remember Job's story? He was suffering, boils from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. And it was not because of any sin. So I'm not suspicious of you. I don't want to call the elders because, you know, but, but God will sometimes put you and put his hand heavy on you and you will not be able to have peace if God is merciful to you. If God as a father would discipline you kindly, he will not let you be at peace in your sin. And you will confess and we will pray and you'll be forgiven. And at least at that level, you'll be healed. God will be saving you, another installment of saving you for that final salvation. 
So we do well to examine our hearts. That's why David prays, search me and try me, O God, and see if there be any wicked or hurtful way in me and lead me in the everlasting way. So I want to just tell you, when you get sick, you know what you should do? I started doing this last, I preached this maybe 10 years ago at my previous church, and I started doing this every time after I got sick. I just, Lord, is there, sick, is there sin in my heart that I'm not aware of? Is there sin that I'm hiding? Have I been fudging and, and, and hiding from people and, and misleading people and giving half-truths? That's a good question to ask yourself when you're sick, even when you have allergies or a cold. That's a good thing to do. It's just good to ask God and examine your heart. Now, Jesus answers prayers. When the centurion called on Jesus to, to heal his servant in Matthew 8, Jesus healed him. Sometimes Jesus says no, though, right? At least temporarily no. Or sometimes he says, wait, Mary and Martha called on Jesus to heal Lazarus. And it said Jesus heard the message and then he waited for a few more days until Lazarus died. That's cold, right? That just seems messed up, right? <laughs> oh, he's sick? All right, I'm going to chill. I'm just going to chill for a minute. That's what he did. He waited. They prayed, calling on the Lord to heal and, and, and then he waits until he dies. Now, he did heal Lazarus, but... But the point there is that God sometimes says no, sometimes he says wait, and sometimes he'll heal you later. Sometimes it's, he won't heal you in this life. But God heals you when you pray. And I want to point out the fact that God heals you here because it's the prayers of faith. But whose prayers of faith in this passage when you're sick? The prayer of faith of whom? The elders. Do you remember when Jesus was um, teaching in a synagogue, or not a synagogue, in a house, a lot smaller than this, room here, than this room here, and it was so packed that no one could get in? And, the, and these guys had a friend who was paralyzed. They brought him in a mat. Do you know how they got them in? How, many, how did they get them in? You guys know? <laughs> Through the roof. What did they do? They start breaking down the roof, and so dirt is falling on people's heads. You don't, they're like, excuse me, can we get our friend through? Nobody's moving. They're just rude, right? Maybe not rude, just, hey, this is just not practical. You're not going to bring a mat in with a packed house. They're packed like sardines in this house, right? And so they're like, fine, if you don't want to move, we'll just... We'll just dump him on your head. So they put a hole out, and they see a hole opening, and they start, they just drop him. Well, if you're not going to move, when we say, excuse me, maybe you'll move when, when the man is falling on your head. So they, they, they drop him. They move out of the way. He's right there. Jesus looks up, and it says in Mark 2, 5, seeing their faith, he said to the man, your sins are forgiven. That's strange. Seeing whose faith? The friend's. The friends who are believing, the friends who are trusting in, in, in this, this man, Jesus, to heal. God doesn't only respond to your faith. He responds to the prayers of faith that people pray for you. So call for the elders. And the prayers of faith can heal. Jesus sometimes answers. Sometimes he delays. Sometimes he says no for the rest of, the life, of this life. But he will always give you a delayed yes in the end and finally save you in the final resurrection, in the final healing, in the final salvation to come for every one of his people. And this healing is a result, actually this healing, I don't know if you know this, this healing is, a, is the healing that God gives you through Jesus when you pray, when they pray in the name of Jesus and anoint you with oil in the name of Jesus. This is a, this is a healing that happens in the name of Jesus. And so every time you get healed, you know why you're healed? Because it's fulfilling a prophecy 700 years before Jesus. You know Isaiah 53, right? Turn to Mark 8, 17, or just listen to it. Mark 8, 17 is quoting Isaiah 53. And in Mark 8, verses 14 through 17, Jesus heals Peter's mom who has a fever. Then he starts casting out these demons. And then it says in Mark 8, 16, he healed all who were sick. And you know why? Verse 17 says, you know why he healed all who were sick? So that what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. He himself took our weaknesses and carried our diseases. What is that talking about? When did Jesus bear our weaknesses and carry our diseases? In Isaiah 53, what is that talking about? When Jesus went where? To the cross. Every healing that you experience, temporary and final healing, is blood-bought because Jesus died for you, which is why you should call for people to pray for you so God gets the credit and we look at the cross and praise God once again for his grace. Yes, doctors can do a lot of good things. Yes, oftentimes you'll be healed anyways by God's providence. But you miss out on the opportunity to give God the glory and celebrate the cross one more time for that healing in your life.
So therefore, James uh, gives his own, therefore call, pray and call for people to pray for you so you grow deeper in divine wisdom. I've done this twice at BBC with two different members. One member who had cancer, our brother Ronnie. Some of you remember our brother Ronnie Kears. I went with another brother to visit Ronnie and I read to him this passage. He had cancer, put oil, olive oil, canola, no, not canola, olive oil, got some olive oil. So yeah, what, what is it, just olive oil just from the house, just grabbed some olive oil, brought it over there, just took a little bit, put it, you know what, put it over his head and then uh, read this passage, explained this is not magic, but I'm gonna pray for you, we're gonna pray for you and ask God to heal you and to save you and to, to come through. And so uh, I asked him if he had any sins to confess to the Lord. Then, I, then we prayed for his healing, for his cleansing and for God to save him. And God met us there. Ronnie was not healed from that cancer. He died from cancer eventually, but God met us there. And I trust that that's part of what God used to finally keep him saved until he passed away. And then James gives us a con concluding application here at James 5.16. James 5.16, here's the concluding application. Uh, in, in verse 16, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. So confess your sins to one another. And when you confess your sins to it, now it's not just pastors now, it's to one another. Confess your sins to one another so that you could be gospelized by each other and discipled by each other. You can't get gospelized and have the gospel applied to your sin if you're hiding your sin, right? So confess your sins and your temptations. We're in covenant together. We have promised not to gossip, but to gospelize. That's what we promised to do for each other, right? We have committed to grow together and we will make mistakes, but we will repent we will hold people accountable for gossip and slander, and we will refresh our faith in Christ, and we'll keep growing and helping each other as we confess our sins to one another and to the Lord for forgiveness of our sins. So confess your sins to one another. Secondly, it says here, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that God moves in response to your prayer so that, the, so that you might be healed. And so just a very practical application, pray through the membership directory. Brothers and sisters, if you're a member of this church, pray for all of the members. Not in one sitting. You can if you want, but pray for the members regularly. Don't continue to strengthen the habit of prayerlessness for the members. Shift it, change it. Even today, God is calling you to do that. Children, if you're a child and a child of the members of our church, then children, ask your parents to pray for you. Ask this church family to pray for you. Ask the pastors to pray for you. And you need to know, kids, that we do pray for you. Your names are in the directory. So when I pray for your parents, I pray for you. Pastor Peter was here praying for some of the parents and prayed for the children by name. We pray for you, but ask us to pray for you because God wants to love you and wants you to trust him. If you're discouraged spiritually, some of you are really spiritually down, this passage is wonderful because God is not telling you to be strong enough to pray. All he's telling you is to what? Ask other people to pray for you. Call on others to pray for you. Tell other members, pray for one another. Ask them to pray for you. Call on the pastors and ask them to pray for you. You don't even have to be spiritually strong to pray. You can be weak. It's okay. You can be discouraged. You can be down. Just say, just pray for me, please. I need prayer. Just ask others to pray for you. You don't have to pray in your season of debilitating discouragement. You can just ask others to pray for you. The good news is, as we sang... Jesus said, if I am weak, I can come to him. Jesus says, if I'm, if I'm weak, if I'm too weak to pray, he will come to me. He'll send elders and other members to pray for me. And the Father will respond to the prayers of faith. So wisely pray and seek the prayers of the righteous. Now, why should we pray? James closes here with some stories or with a story. So let's, let's, let's close here with a story. Here's the principle, though. Look at verse 16, the end of verse 16 and verse 17 and 18. Here's the principle. Why should we pray when we're, when we're suffering? Why should we sing praises when we're cheerful? Why should we pray when we're sick and call others to pray for us when we're sick? And why should we have others pray for us when we're confessing sins? Why pray? Why pray? Why pray? Verse 16. The prayer of a righteous person is what? Very powerful in its effect. Does prayer do something? Yes. Does prayer do something? Yes. So then Ross's prayer is extra convicting for me. Why don't I pray then? I could say yes. I could read this verse. I could preach this verse. 
But you know, if you, you know how you know if you believe this verse? If you pray, if you ask others to pray for you, if you know that prayer is powerful in its effect, why are you not asking people to pray for you? If you know that prayer is powerful in its effect, why are you not praying when you're suffering? Do you believe this? It's true. And it's good news for us. Brothers and sisters, don't give in to hyper-Calvinism or fatalism, that God only ordains the ends and not the means. Yes, God will save you, but he answers prayer. Yes, God will heal you, but he answers prayer. He does something not just with the end of getting healed, he does something in the middle when you pray. Prayer is very powerful in its effect. And, and the story is here of Elijah. He prays for, it says in verses 17 and 18, he prayed for three years, he prayed earnestly that it wouldn't rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain on the land, verse, 18, verse 17, verse 18. Then he prayed again, and the sky gave rain, and the land produced, uh, the land produced its fruit. Why did it rain? Why did it stop raining? Because what? Elijah prayed, and God did what in response to the prayer? He answered the prayer. It's not just the prayer itself, but the prayer and the answer, right? But that's what the effect is. And then why did it start raining again? Because Elijah what? He prayed and God heard and answered the prayer. The prayer of a righteous person is very powerful in its effect. In Job chapter one, verse five, he prayed for his kids. At the end of Job, God was mad at Job's friends who got it wrong. And God said to the friends, Job needs to pray for you. And when Job prays, I'll listen to his prayer. I won't listen to you guys. I'll listen to his prayer and I'll forgive and restore you. And that's what God does. The prayer of a righteous person is very powerful in its effect. Come back tonight. Um, Andrew, our brother Andrew, is going to become preached from Exodus 33. God said when they worshiped the golden calf, he says, I'm not going with you anymore. You guys go to the promised land by yourself. Moses, take them. And Moses prays, God, if you don't go with us, just take me out. If you don't go, I'm not going. We're not going. And God hears and says, okay, I will go with you. Because the prayer of a righteous person is very powerful in its effect. And why is it powerful? Because God hears and answers and responds to prayer. He acts for their good. He acts to bless. He acts to encourage. He acts and responds in prayer. He reacts to bless. Why? Because the prayer of a righteous person is very powerful in its effect. And why is a prayer of a righteous person very powerful in its effect? Because there is the most righteous person who prayed, let this cup be passed from me. And God said, no. He prayed again, a prayer of faith. If anyone prays a prayer of faith, it's Jesus, right? Let this cup be passed from me. God says, no. Third time, let this, prayer, let this cup be passed from me, this cup of wrath, this cup of cursing. I want blessing. React with blessing to my prayer of faith. And God says, no. And so he goes to the cross and drinks the cup and his prayer of faith was rejected. And God said no. So that your prayers and the prayers of the righteous ends in blessing. Because for Jesus, that prayer ended in cursing. Praise God for the cross. And praise God that that wasn't even Jesus' ultimate desire. That was his desire. It was a real desire. But he said, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will but yours be done. And God said yes to that prayer, right? Amen. And that will was done. And that was part of Christ's prayer as well. And so God did say yes to that. But still, in the heart of hearts, when Jesus was suffering, I mean, he even said, guys, pray with me. This is Jesus in his weakness. God, pray for me, right? He tells them, can you stay awake with me? Pray. And, and, and God, by his grace, said no to Jesus in that prayer request so he could say yes to us. And yes to the church family when they pray for you. And yes to your pastors when they anoint you with oil and pray for you. Here's the point. Because Christ the righteous, because Christ, because of Christ the righteous one, because of his death and resurrection, because of his prayers for us, when righteous people like you or I pray for each other, God hears and God answers. And God always, and I'm not meaning that as hyperbole, I mean that literally. God always responds for your good. He only responds for your good, for the deepening of your divine wisdom. So church family, don't underestimate your ministry. The heartbeat and power behind your personal ministry as a member of this church is you praying for other members. 
Because the prayer of a righteous member is very powerful in its effect. So pray and seek the prayers of others for you so that you go deeper in divine wisdom and the blessing of drawing near to our God. Father, take these words and hide them in our hearts so that we would not sin against you. And we thank you for a passage like this because we, when we do sin against you, you call us to call for elders to pray for us, confess our sins to others, and have them pray for us. So we thank you that you forgive our sins even when we have disobeyed this passage. Father, we haven't prayed when we suffer all the time. We haven't sang praises to you when we're cheerful as often as we should. We haven't called for pastors to pray for us when we've been sick in bed and couldn't get up. We haven't told others to pray for us when we needed it and we were too weak to pray ourselves. We have hidden our sins from others and not confessed to others. And so Lord, forgive us and change us. Grow us deeper in divine wisdom that we might know and enjoy Christ Jesus more. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.